Hi there. So this is my second lecture in the structure versus agency part of the theory course that I'm looking at at the moment. Um, the first one was um, looking at the structural argument um, using and introducing you to the sociological imagination of C. Wright Mills. Um, this one is looking at how we can apply the sociological imagination to a couple of different case studies that you can use to illustrate your points in a theory essay. Um, however, this will also have some good links for you to use maybe in a crime and deviance essay or a crime and deviance topic and also in beliefs if you're studying beliefs as well. Um, so hopefully you'll find this useful. So at this point, I'd just like you to quickly recap in terms of the structure versus agency debate. Um, at this point, which approach do you think has it right? And remember, structure, very much determinism. Um, you, we don't have free will. We Our, our behaviour is determined by the social structures around us, whether that be class, gender, ethnicity, or things like family, media, religion. OK, so do you believe in the structural point of view? Or... Um, do you still think it's about free will and actually we are individual agents um, and actually it's our aid, our individual actions that actually help create society around us um, and we're responsible for our behaviours um, and we can actually enact, enact change. If enough of us do something differently, we will actually create changes in social structures around us. So are you more of an agency sociologist? And we will look more at the agency debate in the next lecture in the series as well. Um, so when I'm trying to talk to students very much about whether we are controlled by structures uh, and most of us are quite reluctant to believe that we don't have free will which is fair enough because we, we all want to have free will um, I talk about toilet usage um, and it, this is quite handy for you to reflect on personally and you know if you've got a friend or a family member nearby you can perhaps have a chat with them about this as well and see what they think um, so um, a man enters an empty bathroom um, and imagine there's three urinals in a row there. Uh, which urinal might he use? Okay, so you can pick any urinal. You could use the one on the right, the left, the middle, up to you guys. Now another man enters the urinal. Um, which urinal might he use? So I've given you the example here of um, my two fellas from Clip Art. So if the guy that comes first uses one on the far right, the second one that comes in, um, he's probably going to choose the one on the far left. Why? Why doesn't he go to the middle one? Okay, um, and maybe have a quick think that if the first guy had actually used the middle one um, and then one the guy used one on his right and a left, would that have been okay? And it probably would have. So why? Um, now this generally applies to guys. It doesn't really have the same for women because obviously we have cubicles in women's toilets. But what I'd like you to reflect on is, you know, how much of using uh, a urinal of your choice is actually your own choice? Um, why, I think hopefully you've realised that most uh, men, boys, wouldn't choose a urinal right next to the, um, the gentleman who arrived first. Um, and why is that? What is it about us, our culture, our, our norms and our values that stops people kind of doing that? Um, now, we would have a class discussion around this, about norms and values, um, and you've got to remember that values are things that society and our cultures find important, and norms are our behaviours um, that we use, to, that reflect our values. So the reason why um, uh, you wouldn't go into a urinal right next to the a gentleman who's already in there is because we value privacy. OK, we value our personal space and, the, and we're pretty big in that, particularly in British culture. Um, so the norm would be to not go to the urinal right next to the gentleman who was already in there. The norm would be to leave the space. Now, obviously, if there's already two guys in there and you're the third guy arriving, in which case it becomes normal to go to that urinal because you haven't made that conscious choice to go really close to the guy who's already in there or the gentleman already in there. You've had to because you've got limited options. So can you think of any other similar social situations where actually your behaviour is predetermined by social structures. So in this case, I've said, you know, the structures would be the, the cultural values and the cultural norms that you've been socialised into by your family, perhaps your peer group, probably more often more so with urinals. Um, and a good example I always think about is um, things like, why would you, at lunch and break time in your school or college, why, why do you sit in the same places uh, with your mates? Or well, maybe you don't, but most students do. They have a, you know, a particular sofa or a particular desk or a particular part of uh, the playground or the outside space in which you sit in. Why do you always go there? 
And what would happen if you uh, suddenly went and sat in another spot that you knew that another group occupied all the time? Would they react to that in a negative way? Or, you know, there probably would be some reaction. Um, and another good example to illustrate this point of view is also sitting on the bus. Um, so many of you might use buses um, to get to and from college. Um, you know, if you're on the bus uh, and you were the, one of the first ones on there and you sat by yourself somewhere on the bus and at the next stop, somebody else got on and they came and sat right next to you, even though there was all those other free seats, why would that be abnormal? Okay, so it's something to do with our norms and values, very similar to the urinal, urinal example. So what I'm trying to suggest to you guys is perhaps we haven't got full control of our actions. We can't do whatever we want, okay, because we are socialised into quite a strict set of norms and values that we don't want to deviate from because we'll be seen as, well, deviant, as some of you all know from your crime and deviant studies. So what does this really tell us about the structure and agency debate? <clears throat> um, well, what structures determine the norms, sorry, it's gone a bit merged there. What structures determine the norms and values of toilet usage? Uh, so there's other things to think about here, like, is it okay for men to talk in the bathroom? So, and is it, and can women talk to each other? So now I'm getting you to think of maybe about the structure of gender and how gender predetermined your behavior in toilet situations. Um, men, you know, obviously I haven't used many urinals in my time. Um, do they stand there and do they chat? Do they get quite close to each other in the urinals? Um, or is it quite lighthearted sort of banter chat? Do they have intimate chats about relationship? Like, I'm, I'm thinking men generally don't have those intimate chats about relationships and dating and personal troubles while they're having a pee. Uh, whereas for women, that's very different. Like, the toilet is a real social space for women. Okay. Um, another example when it comes to toilets, like, I don't know if you've ever had this, but quite often when girls go to the loo in a bar or a restaurant or a, a nightclub, they'll get their mates to go with them. Um, and that's perfectly normal in our society. Um, but how might you react if you were out with a bunch of mates and one fella stood up to go to the loo and turned around to his mate and said, hey, mate, do you want to come with me to the loo? Like, that would be sort of unusual. Um, so something about our gender means that we've got certain expectations around behaviour and toilet usage of what would be normal and abnormal. Um, and I guess where we're going to go next with this, it's applying the sociological imagination, really. Um, and by the way, I would suggest if you ever do get the chance to sit in a bar, restaurant, club or whatever is to perhaps sit quietly and have a quick look at uh, the behaviour of people going to and from the loo. Like, do you see that rule of girls going in groups and men going as individuals? And maybe consider, like, if you do see men going to the toilets together, particularly in clubs and bars late in the evening, um, what else could be going on if it's not perhaps toilet usage? Um, and um, I'm just making the sort of allusion, if you like, to um, perhaps drug usage and maybe look at perhaps their behaviour when they leave the toilet because if they're suddenly really animated and really chatty, um, perhaps they've been doing them more than just perhaps going to the loo in that toilet. So just have a think about that. And that'll be applying your sociological imagination if you ever do have a chance to sit in the bar and look at people going to the loo. Um, but that'll probably make you look a bit weird, so you have to be quite subtle about that. Um, <clears throat> other structures that can determine behaviour around toilets is things like, you know, your location, uh, and particularly your national or geographical location in the world, and can, how can that determine your toilet habits? Uh, some of you might have been to France, where, in, particularly in campsites, they have stand-up toilets. Um, others might have explored a bit further. Some of you might have even been all the way to Southeast Asia, where they use squat toilets. Um, However, what I want us to really zoom in on now is um, looking at India and some of the issues they have around toilet usage in India, uh, which is, let's face it, using the toilet is a private trouble. Okay, it's a private issue. Okay, you don't want to talk very much about your toilet usage. It's private, pretty much. Um, so this is really good for illustrating the sociological imagination. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is, um, if you can, depending on how you're watching this lecture, use your phone or what have you to scan that QR code, which hopefully will take you to this article. Um, and if you can't do that because you're probably listening to this lecture on your phone, you can just Google. Uh, it's a BBC article and it's called India's Long, Dark and Dangerous Walk to the Toilet. What I'd like you to do is read this article. I might have shared it with you already if you're in my class. I'd like you to read this article and I want you to answer the questions below. So what is the private trouble? And why is it seen as a private issue? So it's something about toilet usage and what are the really private issues around it? And it's quite, you need to kind of really examine the article in depth to kind of get to that. Uh, but why is this actually a public issue? 
What public pro problems does this cause? So again, that's all about the sociological imagination, thinking, right, hang on, it's a private issue, but it's happening to lots of people, so therefore it must be a public issue. And actually, what problems is this causing? Uh, what are the causes or structural causes of the private trouble? And what are solution what solutions are there? And you can research this yourself. So what are the possible solutions to India's toilet issues? So what I'd like you to do is pause this um, lecture now, and I'd like you to have a read of that article. It is quite a lengthy one, okay? And then come back to the, the lecture and we'll run through some of the ideas you've come up with. So this is just some of my brief notes on these points. And like I said, I can't stress enough. It's really important you read the articles for yourselves just to really find, <clears throat> find out for yourselves the issues that many of the women particularly face in India when it comes to um, toilets usage. So it's a private trouble because the issue is in rural India, women can't pee during daylight. So from the article, hopefully you've discerned that um, there is a lack of actual toilets in rural India. Um, uh, there, It's very much linked to the patriarchal culture in India where husbands or men or elders have money for the for the for the village, for example, they very rarely invest it in things like toilets because men can quite easily pee and perhaps defecate um, in the open without any problems. So they don't spend money on those issues, those areas. They spend money on TVs. They spend money on motorbikes. You know, things that make their lives easier. Very rarely toilets. So in rural rural India, women um, have to, if you like, pee and defecate in fields, as do men. Um, but the cultural norm in India is that it's quite an embarrassing thing to do. Um, so and for women particularly, because they're seen as, you know, as, as quite precious and, you know, they're seen as quite vulnerable to an extent and they they need to kind of mind their dignity. They got to keep covered up. So women can only really do this um, in under the cover of night. So women have to hold pee and poo and they can only do it at night time. OK, um, which is obviously quite difficult, um, particularly if you pick up um, um, a virus uh, or diarrhea um, or, as I think the example in the article hopefully talked to you about, a pregnant woman uh, who where you have to pee quite a lot when you're pregnant because you've got no room for your bladder. So um, that's why it's very much a private trouble. Um, and people won't talk about it as well. People will not talk about it. Um, so the second one was like, what's causing this uh, issue? So... <clears throat> As I mentioned, like sort of the cultural traditions and attitudes about defecation is that it's seen as dirty and embarrassing. Like that's the same in our culture. We don't talk openly about defecation. It's it's not something that's discussed very openly, really. Um, it is seen as sort of dirty and embarrassing. Um, you know, women can't raise this issue very openly in their communities in, in India, um, as it's seen as an, a, a no go area. It's a taboo subject. Um, but there's also bigger structures like. Uh, there isn't the infrastructure really in India, particularly rural India, sorry, for, for a large number of toilets. There's a lack of land uh, and pipes and water for sewage in, in the slums, particularly in the cities or in the countryside, as I just mentioned. Um, and there's really a lack of will to develop these things, as I mentioned, um, because of men controlling so many aspects of the culture. Um, there is the view, um, and this is again a link to the patriarchal nature of Indian culture, uh, that women shouldn't be out at night un unaccompanied. Okay, they shouldn't be out at night unaccompanied. And if they are, they're asking for trouble. That, that idea that, well, if she's out by herself, she's clearly searching for a man, she's fair game, she, she can be a targeted for sexual violence and it's her responsibility for being at night and unaccompanied because no respectable woman would be that, be out uh, un unaccompanied. So that's very much linked to patriarchal culture they're socialised into from family media, for ex example. And as I've mentioned before, men in the family controlling finances and not spending the money on sanitation, send it, spending it on products that they, they want for themselves. Um, <clears throat> now, like I said, this does seem like a private trouble. We've linked it to structural causes. But why is this a big social problem? Well, as the article made clearly, is sexual harassment. OK, um, and that's very much a problem for women. Um, um, the sexual harassment issue, it's probably hasn't been seen as, as important as a spreading of diseases issue that I'll come to in a second, purely because it's a problem for women. And the patriarchal nature of the culture in India is that, you know, it's a problem for women. It's not really a problem for men, so we don't need to worry about it too much because women are less valuable as such. Um, so like I said, women seen out in the dark seen as fair game. And this kind of has led to a, a quite a significant rape culture and a culture of silence after the rape as well, which is linked back to that idea that women are responsible for being victimised. 
Uh, so you can make very strong links between this example and gender and crime. Um, look at a, as a global example of women as victims, women not being able to report, women being victimised in a secondary way by the criminal justice system, um, by the police, for example. Um, and I know some of you will have read up about the case of India's daughter, Jyoti Singh, um, who was hot, brutally murdered after a rape in India. But we'll come to that in a second. And one of the issues, not just of women having to pee just at night time, but this open defecation, uh, this practice in India, that both in the rural India of using fields, um, but also in the cities, um, you know, uh, many workers don't have access to clean toilets. The slums don't ha really have clean toilets um, or any toilets, sorry. So both men and women have to defecate in the streets, um, uh, between cars, down alleyways. Uh, that filters into, you know, water supply. Um, so there's huge issues around um, spreading of diseases, both in the countryside and in, in the cities in India, because of this defecation, this lack of access to toilets by, you know, a huge number of people um, who suffer poverty in India. So... The final stage of the process, using our sociological imagination, is to come up with a social policy to solve this problem. Um, so what could um, politicians do? What should sociologists be suggesting happens, both in the countryside and perhaps in the cities? Um, in terms of the countryside, um, you know, it could be a case of, you know, um, handing out grants to build what's called a drop toilet, when you basically dig a really deep hole and you, you put a toilet above it and all of the waste goes straight down this really deep hole um, and then when it eventually fills up you then dig another really deep hole so things like that so you don't need to put in um, pipes for example and in the cities it might be something more like well actually do put in toilet blocks where they're needed in the cities because uh, you perhaps have more access to things like to, uh, a plumbing and sewage facilities um, <clears throat> But what I'd like you guys to do um, is have a quick look at this clip. It's a short advert for a charity, uh, in, uh, a charity initiative, I guess, called Use My Loo. Um, you can QR scan using that, or if you can find it on YouTube, you just search for Use My Loo, uh, toilets for one million women in India. Um, and I'd like you to identify from that clip what's the problem, the private trouble, what are the different um, uh, problems that this private trouble is causing for the rest of society, um, is it how what is it caused how is it caused by wider social structures because it will talk to you about like um toilet projects but why why are they not being implemented what are the problems in india that's slowing down the building of all these toilets that are desperately needed um there's some structural issues in india that are stopping these things getting done um and finally what's their solution so use my loo isn't necessarily a government policy it is a charity policy but it is a good idea to solve this problem in the cities anyway uh, and it talks very much about working women uh, women as domestic servants um, particularly even though they might spend all day cleaning these toilets uh, for the middle class in India uh, they're not actually allowed to use them and it's linked to the caste system this idea that our lower castes aren't as clean are dirty and they shouldn't be um, uh, allowed to use toilets um, very similar to some of the issues some of you might have come across with the civil rights movement in America where black women, for example, were domestic servants but weren't actually allowed to use the toilet facilities um, in, in America either. So please have a look at that clip and can you add that as an example to illustrate the social imagine, sociological imagination. Um, however, the current Prime Minister of India, Modi, um, he actually was somewhat unusual in his initial election campaign because he campaigned, one of, it, one of his issues he campaigned on was this idea of toilets before temples. Um, and he sort of said, look, we need to stop building all these huge temples to show how, um, how what a good um, Hindu we are, you are. And actually we need to start investing in these facilities for women. And it was one of the reasons why he was very, very popular in the rural communities. Um, he got many, many votes from the rural communities. Um, and he wanted to end open defecation so it might be worth having a quick google of this policy of toilets before temples by Modi and see how effective it's been um it, it certainly hasn't 100 percent been implemented um but you might want to find out how it's going do a bit of evaluation of this policy you know did he just say it to go elected is that another structural problem in india 
Um, and But the fact is, he did bring it into public dialogue uh, for one of the first times, um, and people were starting to openly talk about this issue in India, so it kind of st- stopped being such a private issue and started to become more of a public public problem and a part of the public uh, narrative. Um, you know, you could argue that I think sociological research or research, scientific research, you know, environmental research have all been part of him kind of bringing this into the open. Um, and, you know, that's what T. Wright Mills said we need to do. We need to kind of present these problems to politicians, make a lot of noise about them so they actually do invent policies to make things better. Um, there is some links here, just to kind of link back to your education unit, uh, that many schools in India um, don't really have uh, working toilet facilities. Um, and generally, if they are there, they're not even used. So, you know, the girls won't access them. Sometimes they're used for storage. Um, you know, they, if they break, they're not fixed. Um, and actually, this links to um, a sort of poor educational achievement of girls. Um, so girls will actually stay home during menstruation when they're on their periods. Um, and they won't go to school because there's nowhere for them to kind of clean themselves and replace pads or what have you, um, which has a huge impact on their educational achievement. Um, so in India, for example, these girls are getting poor, poorly, poor education or no education. Um, and this if they do manage to get to school, um, they are not able to access it full time. They're kind of having to take maybe the best part of a week off every month, which is leading to lower educational achievement, which is making women more likely to be poor. So that's a real structural problem in India as well. Uh, and this just reinforces the inequality, okay, which means they're going to be less likely to kind of get good jobs and get access to good facilities in the first place. Um, so finally, before I move on here, I just want to ask you to try and make links between the problems with India's toilets and the social issues around it, particularly at night time and the idea of women who are going to the fields to use, um, to defecate. How does that link to the India's daughter case that I mentioned earlier on? Okay, so in terms of structural causes, what, what issues are you seeing appear in more than one case? So you should be able to talk about India as quite a useful exact case study, if you like, across a couple of different units. So... What I'd like you to do um, is summarise in your notes how India's toilet issues demonstrates the application and use of C. Wright Mill's sociological imagination. And um, effectively what you're doing is saying, hey, structures are responsible for human behaviour. We need to sort some of these structural issues out through social policies. You, you're making a point for the structure agency debate. Um, so I'd like you to do this in a paragraph or practice your analysis skills for those 30 mark essays if it's a crime and deviance question or a 20 mark essays if it's a theory question or possibly a 10 marker but it's more likely to be useful in a 20 marker. So uh, you need to talk about a very private issue. What is a private issue? You need to talk about actually this is not just a private issue. This is happening to more than one woman so therefore it's a social pattern. It's a social problem. What are the social causes of this private trouble? Okay, or structural causes of this private trouble. Think about patriarchy, think about culture, think about poverty. And then discuss the social policy solutions to solve this problem. So I'm effectively asking you to summarise your notes in one paragraph using the England, India's toilet issues. So how does this then link to the structure agency debate? Um, so this clearly shows how wider social structures cause private troubles. Um, which is, again, the job of the sociologist is to connect the structural causes to the private troubles and demonstrates how if we can address, adjust structure through social policy, we can actually solve many of these private troubles. Um, and if anything, it really does prove that free will and choice is very limited for certain groups in society. Um, so the norms, cultural norms, prevent women from defecating during the day and um, but and also it's class and caste restrictions that uh, stops their prevents their access to private toilets. So yes, these issues that we've been talking about in this lecture are very much for about the poorer women, the middle class women who have their own toilets. These issues don't affect them in the same way. Okay, so it, 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 it not everyone has the same level of free choice, and you could argue that the poorer you are, the less choice you have which is a useful way of analysing the structure and evaluating the structural argument. You could say, actually, you know, if you have more wealth, you have got more free will. So actually, structure doesn't apply equally to all people in society. So, so while you can make a really strong argument using C. Wright Mills that structure is very, very important um, and structural perspectives are dominant, um, Mills was a little bit on the fence about this as well. And he did argue that 
the way society operates is a bit of a mixture of structure and agency. Uh, he argued that we have to recognise that, yes, individuals are influenced by social structures such as family, work and religion, as well as things like class and gender. But he argued as well, structures are influenced by individuals and they do change and adapt in response to changes in individuals' ideas, values and norms and collective behaviour. So probably one of the more obvious examples to illustrate this view would be looking at the family as a unit. Um, how has the family changed in response to shifting attitudes? So if we think about, I don't know, a 1940s family, I suppose, um, you know, the, the, that family would have been very, the normal family would have been the nuclear family. So a married man and uh, married to a woman living with their own biological children. That was the norm. OK, so. Why is that no longer the norm, the dominant, the, the nuclear family is no longer really the dominant family model. It might be the one that everyone strives for, but not everyone, um, but it's not dominant. There are a variety of family types. There are divorced uh, family structures, there's reconstituted families, um, there's lone parent families, you know, and there are single person households, people that choose, and there's people who cohabit, they don't even marry. So... What attitudes among us as individuals have changed and shifted that have meant that the structure of our family is now very different? So, and what things have led to those difference, differences? Uh, one that I will give you an example of. So same-sex marriage um, has become more of a norm. Um, and I think that could perhaps be linked to our shifting norms and values, what we see as normal, and that could possibly be linked to the collapse of religion as a dominant force in society. And there's also the example of equality for women. So our views about women being equal, women being able to work, has led to changes in the family. So what, what, what changes in the family do you see because women are perhaps more equal in terms of their financial power and their role within the home as well? Um, and I just want to finish off looking at Mills here by analysing his relationship to Marxism. Um, he he really is a fan of Marx and he he... And he initially probably was something of a Marxist, but then became a bit frustrated with it. Um, he, and he liked that Marx identified this idea of a ruling class. And, and Mills, throughout his work, talks about this power elite, and he's very critical of this power elite. He, he points out that this power elite tries to prevent social change. They want to keep power for themselves. They want to centralise money in, in their own, um, sort of under their own control, which sounds just like Marx's ruling class. Um, he talks about this power elite controlling the media, controlling the military, controlling the economy, um, which really means that the rest of us in society are kind of subject to their, con their authority. Um, however, he does say that many of the predictions of Marx have actually been rendered out of date by the 20th century. Um, so when you think about which prediction in particular, I'd say about the revolution. Marx predicted a revolution. He said it was most likely to happen where capitalism was most developed. And at the time of his writings, it would have probably, he predicted it would probably most likely happen in, in Britain, uh, where the workers would unite and overthrow their, the controllers of the means of production, uh, the bourgeoisie. Uh, that never happened, okay? Um, and he, Marx said it, it was an inevitable stage of the imbalance of the means of production, but it hasn't happened yet. So this has actually made his predictions out of date, if you like. Um, you could, and we will look at this a bit later on in the Marxist topic, uh, you could argue that the, the revolution just hasn't happened yet. Um, and it's still um, in the future. People will eventually realise the inequality is, is really untenable. We can't we can't survive with such few people controlling the resources and so many of us suffering poverty, for example. Um, but at this stage, Mills was like, look, it hasn't happened. We thought it would happen during the Industrial Revolution. It didn't. Um, we need to look at alternative ways of changing society. So he said then, this is where the sociologist role comes in. So instead of looking for revolutionary change, um, sociologists need to change society through social policy by pointing out problems. So we need to make we need to influence policy makers and government, for example. And that would be Mills's approach to social change. So just to um, summarize how you can use Mills and the sociological Im imagination in the structure agency debate. <clears throat> is because he highlights the importance of structures causing both private troubles and those private troubles, if they happen to enough people, therefore cause wider social issues in society. 
Um, you've learned a lot about different examples to illustrate the power of structures. Uh, so we looked at the domestic violence case in the previous lecture. There was lots of different structures there that caused domestic violence. Um, you know, our patriarchal culture, the role of the media. Um, I've just pointed out here, like the economic deindustrialization causing domestic violence. So changes in the economy as a structure has led to a lack of jobs for men, uh, working class men in particular. So as a result, they're not able to fulfill their breadwinner status so they can reinforce their masculinity at home through violence, whether that's fin financial control, emotional violence or physical violence. Um, in this lecture, we've looked at, in a lot of detail, um, the violence against women um, in India. Um, and we've looked at poverty, um, in particular, the issue of the lack of access to clean toilet facilities means that women who have to go out in the fields or go out in the streets uh, become fair game. And there's also that sort of patriarchal culture that runs through many aspects of Indian society that has sort of legitimised the sexual violence in women in India. Um, and you'll know that from the case of Jyoti Singh as well, India's daughter, that horrible rape case when she was raped on the bus um, and then murdered, <clears throat> um, as well as the spread of disease as well, which is a problem for all genders in India, or both genders, sorry, um, rather than just women. Um, and finally, you know, if you really are struggling with these other examples, just try and remember that toilet example. Um, to illustrate the power of social structures. You're not going to remember all the examples that I've talked to you about in the exam, or I don't think you will. Try and pick one or two that you can remember and remember them in a lot of detail. Okay, so worst comes to worst, just talk about how, you know, you can't even use the right cubicle in the toilet if you're a bloke. You can't choose whatever cubicle you want because that would be weird if you went and stood next to the fellow who was already in there. Um, however, it is worth remembering from an evaluative point of view that Mills does recognise that individual agents can affect social structures and change them over time uh, and use the example perhaps of family to illustrate that or even religion. You know, that's worth thinking about as well. OK, thanks for listening. And there'll be another lecture coming up on the agency debate and symbolic interactionism as a theory.